UCF fans, welcome to another edition of the Daily Night. I am your host, Brian Smith, and I'm also the publisher at Inside the Nights on Fan Nation, powered by Sports Illustrated. This edition is going to be strictly about the passing attack for the Knights as they go up against the Bulls and the war on I-4. And I'm going to be talking about just the kind of the overall thought about it, but I'm also personally interested to see what Jalen does. He should be pretty much about as healthy as he's going to get now, being in a football season. He's played a little bit. I'm curious to see what UCF does in regards to attacking the Bulls with Jalen down the field. He's he's done that a little bit. He's gotten his legs back under him. His conditioning should be better. It's just part of getting back into it after missing about half a season. I think he's going to have some uh, big plays in this game. But I'm going to talk about Jalen in segment two. First off, going to just kind of go over a few things, a few players for the Bulls and some expectations or lack thereof based on their defense, and here are a couple of things. I, I talked a little bit about this yesterday, but I'm going to go more specific into it in regards to what they've done defensively. USF is not exactly doing well in the secondary, and they have one of the worst pass defense in the country, one of the worst rush. They can't get after the quarterback, yada, yada, yada. They've only got nine sacks, but keep that in mind. In the last three games, they gave up 385 to Cincinnati, or excuse me, to Houston, 304 to Cincinnati and 311 to Tulane. This is a league where everybody throws the ball. It's not surprising they gave up yardage. It's hard to stop teams. That has absolutely been the case for years. But 300 three weeks in a row is a sign of just ineptitude. So looking at some of their players and going through the stats, going through, see what they did in the last game, etc. I, I found it very interesting that they didn't do very well in the secondary, making a lot of tackles. I have a feeling if you guys are beat up, you're in and out of the lineup, that kind of thing. Coaches aren't going to talk a lot about that, especially right before a rivalry game, and everybody should understand. That being stated, Antonio Greer is their stud. He's their linebacker. He's a heck of a football player. The Bulls are going to use him in a myriad of ways. I don't think he's going to be able to help much against guys like Jay and Ryan O'Keefe, though, and that is where this comes into play. Their best defensive back, depending on one's perspective, is Vincent Davis. He's got 58 tackles. That's pretty good. But is that a situation where he's making tackles in the first 10 yards from the line of scrimmage, or is it 10 yards and they're they're back? I have a feeling that a lot of those fall into the latter category based on their statistics. So here are a couple other guys for them that have done pretty well in terms of just statistics. These are just raw data points, nothing more and nothing less. Uh, Daquan Evans, he's a defensive back for the Bulls, 53 tackles. Mikhail LaPointe, he's another defensive back, 53 tackles as well. Matthew Hill, he's a safety. He has 50 tackles. So when you have that many guys in a row, if you look at it, they got four guys in a row for number three, four, five, and six on their tackle list in their secondary. They got two linebackers at the top. They got Greer, who's a stud. And then they got Bowles, who's pretty darn good, too. They're both senior linebackers. They rely on them a lot. They don't come out a lot. But they just just don't have anybody up front that's making a ton of tackles. And that's a little concerning. Thad Mangum is their best D lineman based on just tackle production. I don't know if that means he's really the best or guys have been hurt or whatever. I've only watched them two or three times, and I really didn't focus on their D line because they were getting shredded. But they're not getting sacks. Maybe that's why the DBs are struggling. Uh, you can only cover for so long. I don't care if you have Deion Sanders and Daryl Green, two of the greatest players to ever play corner in the NFL at each spot. You're going to struggle if you give up four seconds or more to that quarterback. That's kind of the unwritten rule in college and pro football. And this is no different. This is no different. UCF has started to make more progressions in terms of we're not going to just throw the ball. And they they use the screen game a lot, so that's a side point. But we're not just going to throw the ball short. They've started using over routes, meaning a guy comes kind of just a loop over across the field. They've been using those a little bit more. They've been using plays where it's a deep shot. Gus Malzahn talked about this quite a bit in a press conference. We've been pushing the ball down the field, et cetera. They've been doing that more. If you can't get to the quarterback, one can be assured UCF 
is going to absolutely do everything they can to take shots. I, and I think it'll be early in the game as well. There's no reason to hold back. This is not a good football team they're going against. They give up chunk yardage plays, meaning 15, 20 yards and above. UCF has a chance to make plays down the field. And again, I'll get to Jalen in a second, but here's a couple of things to think about. If you have more time, it's going to make you feel more comfortable in the pocket. So Mikey Keene is going to be in a scenario where if he wants to just hit, you know, a guy on a shallow cross, if he's open, sure, go ahead. That may not be your primary read, but if you get a guy like a Mark Johnson on a shallow cross or Jalen Robinson on a shallow cross, it could be a 25 yard play in a heartbeat, if not a 75 yard play. But you got to make one guy miss on the backside and you're down the sidelines and you're gone, you know, out that back gate. That's, that's what this kind of team can do because UCF has a ton of speed at receiver. So we have Titus, it could be anybody. The point is he might take a few extra shots down the field because the offensive line is good, very experienced, and he might have a few more plays in this game than he has in any other conference game in terms of not just, okay, my middle ability, I know what's going on more now, I've got experience, but just have time. Like Cincinnati, SMU, and some of the other teams they've played, they've done better up front. Based on what I'm seeing from USF and just seeing them a little bit this year, it's not like I studied them. Um, there's not much to study. They're two and nine. But you you got to think they're going to take shots down the field just consistently. In the first half, if they took five, it would not surprise me. You want me to find that. A shot means 20 plus yards down the field in the air, conservatively, probably 30. Um, you can throw a post that's about 20 yards in the air, something like that as well. Those are very common plays. You got to throw it just over the linebacker in front of the safety, et cetera. And it depends on if it's an open or closed coverage, meaning two high safeties open, cover three, it's a guy in the middle of the field, it's closed. Those are difficult. Cover three, it's pretty darn hard to throw that kind of play, but there are other ways to do it too. So UCF is going to run seam routes against that. They might run to posts against an open coverage, whatever. It's, it's not that complex, but there's no reason to worry about getting sacked. They've got nine sacks in 11 games. That's atrocious. It's dead last in college football. They need to attack down the field. So with that, before I go into segment two, here is your question for this podcast. UCF is probably the not just superior team talent-wise, but far superior. Based on the numbers, based on just how horrific they have been, and here, let me give you just a, a statistic to help. They, they are just being bludgeoned, basically. They've given up over 3,000 yards passing this year. 3,058 yards passing. They've given up 25 touchdown passes. That's in 11 games. That's horrific. Should UCF go up top early and often? And, you know, they're a running team, first and foremost. There's no doubt about that. Should they pass more, especially early, to take advantage of what the Bulls have not been able to do, especially lately in their last three games, as a pass defense. It's debatable. Segment two. To that end, I think Jalen is going to be the guy. I'm not saying he's going to catch it, but that's who they're going to try and go to. They want to get him back involved. He's a guy that's just a special football player. He's a great guy. Gus Malzahn gushed about him the other day at the press conference, and he should. He, Jalen's a good dude. You want to see him come back. He's been very supportive of his teammates. He missed half the season with a knee injury. Now he's back in the lineup. You want him to go out against this team in a rivalry game, the war on I-4, with the highest mark. You want him to have a touchdown or a 50-yard gate, something that is very, very important, not only for the game, but for Jalen. You know, hey, here's your reward. Let's see what we can do for you. You've been good to us. Okay. Well, I think they're going to take at least a couple shots to him. And I'm, I'm not exactly announcing something that USF will be shocked by. The question is simply this for them. Can you stop it? I don't think they can. Because USF doesn't have very good run defense either. So they're in a quandary. Do we bring the safety into the box? What are we going to do? If they sit back and cover two, two high safeties, you hear that a lot by announcers, U UCF will be in second and five all day at worst because they're just going to power the football in inside zone, maybe a trap play or something like that, quarterback run. 
as, as Gus mentioned, Mikey started to run the ball a little bit. That changes their offense completely. Um, if he gets 30 to 50 yards rushing a game, the other team's in deep trouble. This is going to be a very big bit. I mean, not even a challenge for USF. But remember, they just fired their defensive coordinator Sunday. So UCF is in a bit of a quandary themselves because they don't even know what to expect now. They're just going to throw the kitchen sink at us. That's my opinion or something else. But the bottom line, the players don't change. They haven't stopped the big passing plays. They don't tackle well, et cetera. You don't give up 300 yards a game over three consecutive games and be a good tackling team. You just don't. And the pressure is bad. So Jalen's going to get at least one, if not two deep shots early. And I'm curious to see what they do with Brandon Johnson as well. Cause I, I don't think there's much choice. Brandon has been the touchdown leader for the Knights this year. Let me see here what we got overall on his stats. I know that he's just a guy that teams don't always respect, and he plays the boundary side. It's very difficult to double the boundary. That's the you know side closest to the ball because if you double that, the, the open side of the field for screens and sweeps, it really becomes difficult to defend. UCF has taken advantage of that. And they, they found Brown and, uh, Brandon a lot, especially in the red zone. His uh, receiving statistics are pretty impressive. He has 37 catches. Ten of them have gone for scores. That could be another guy, especially, again, closer to the red zone, 25 and in, 30 and in. You might see a few fade balls, just jump balls. My guy's better than you. That's what I think. Hopefully, they're able to connect on some of those. And he's done a good job on corner routes, stop routes, stop fade, it, anything that you want to run. He can he can do those things from a full gamut. That's why he plays so much. He knows the route tree, and he has a chemistry with not only Keen. He had he had a chemistry with Dylan Gabriel really quickly as well. I don't think there's going to be a chance to look at him and say anything other than we're going to get you the football too if they go single coverage all game. How many he gets is really just up to Keen. That's that's a feel thing. Do you take him over and over? Or just keep you know single. Just throw it to him. He could catch eight ten balls because I think at some point USF's going to try to step in and stop the run. Johnny's probably going to have a good game. We do not know if Bowser's going to play a ton, but even if he doesn't, Mark Anthony Richards is, is a really good football player. He's coming on. That is another guy that Gus mentioned in his press conference. He's impressed with him. He's happy to see that he's taking that next step. Johnny, too. They both ran the ball hard inside. And to quote Gus Malzahn on the touchdown run from Mark Anthony Richards, he willed himself into the end zone. He broke a tackle, then he had another guy on him, and he just ran through the guy. That's pure effort. I mean, they, they stacked the box. UCF still ran it. We're better than you. Here we come. Punch you right in the mouth. That's, that's what we did. When teams start doing that, defensive coordinators don't like it. They bring guys in the box. Brandon should be single covered for most of the game, if not all of it, quite frankly. And again, 37 catches, 551 yards, 10 scores. He's averaging 14.9 yards per reception. That's really good for a boundary guy. This, this is an opportunity for him to catch not just one, but maybe two touchdowns. He may only have four catches. I mean, they, they may not connect with him a lot, but it, a couple of them could be scores. Um, I think they'll throw some shots down to him too. Maybe not quite as long per se, as Jalen, because the jump balls and stuff and the corner routes make it a little more difficult to get yards after the catch. But he could just run a go route and go by somebody, too. It's not out of the question. Um, the uh, last point I'm going to make, and this is just something that, that happens in most rivalry games, UCF and USF for the war on I-4 will not be different. Expect at least one, if not two, trick plays similar to what we saw against UConn. It'll be something different than they, what they've done before. Gus Malzahn loves trick plays. He's done it for years. He comes up with them. Last week, O'Keefe found Johnson. There you go. 49-yard touchdown. It goes into the end zone at six points, so that's fine. Um, they're going to throw screens and bombs to O'Keefe too, but he could be running a reverse. It could be Ryan O'Keefe in the Wildcat a couple of times, and then they get down in the end zone, and, he, and he's there, and then he throws a jump pass or something. Who knows? Look for a couple of plays like that. And again, it's a wide open gauntlet of opportunities to look at. There's no, there's no way that you can really project what Gus Malzahn is going to come up with that. He's, he's pretty good. So anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the daily night. 
I hope everybody enjoyed. I'm going to have some information on UCF every day this week. And the uh, war on I-4 is fascinating to me because the fan bases, quite frankly, hate each other. So let's talk football. If you have any questions, hit me up. I'm happy to talk it. anything you want to talk about. You can find me on Twitter. I can I can put that up, actually. But there, there's nothing about this game that's just not fun. It just is. It just, it's just fun. UCF is one of those teams that really has come so far. And, and a lot of it's due to this game. People didn't know. They just didn't know what you, this program could do. And Gus has talked about that. So and there's the, there's my uh, Twitter handle. If you got questions, you got something you want to say regarding this, this podcast or anything about the war on I four, hit me up on Twitter at FB scout underscore Florida. That is at FB scout underscore Florida. That's my main Twitter handle. I also have one for UCF as well, but th- the bottom line and here's, and here's this one for those of you watching on, this on YouTube uh, at UCF underscore fan nation. Um, there's a lot of things that are going to go on in this game to try to score points. So uh, I, that's what this episode's about. And, and hopefully, hopefully they get a lot of points early in the game and they can just kind of dictate to USF. So the Knights can kind of have some fun with the fans and, and play calling and stuff, but there's no reason on the stats to think anything otherwise. So everybody have a great day and I will talk to you on Wednesday as well.